What time signature is the theme from Bluey in? A couple months back, there was some discourse about what the time signature for the theme song of Bluey is supposed to be. And, you know, I have I have some opinions here. I'm most inclined to agree with how Tara McGurk hears this as three measures of 4-4 four, four, and one measure of 5-4. Synced along with the sheet music, it would look and come together like this. One, two, three, four. You know, this is probably how I would prefer the sheet music to be written. If I was given the sheet music, it would be easy to sight read. I'd be able to know the relationship of the pulse to the other instruments around me. But that is not enough. What is the true intent of the composer of the Bluey theme song? What is the true time signature? I, I kid you not, this is the official published sheet music of the Bluey theme song. And while delightful, it doesn't give us any information about the time signature. It doesn't give us any information about the downbeat or anything like that. When asked, the composer of the Bluey theme song, Joff Bush, said that this three measures of 4-4 four, four and one measure of 5-4 was the way that he was essentially thinking about it. So case closed, right? Well. Not really, because there are other ways of thinking about this music that are not for the professional musician's benefit. For example, there was one guy who was talking about how it was difficult to teach his kids when to shout the name of the characters in the introduction theme song because it seemed like it was kind of random. And even looking at the sheet music, the names of all the characters are occurring at completely different locations within the bar. Mom is on beat one, dad is on beat five, etc. So this dad taught his kids to count backwards from three at the end of the musical phrase to know when they're supposed to shout the name of the character. Each person that gets introduced, <laughs> there's less and less of rest. So for mom, it's three rests, goes back to the melody. Then for dad, it's two rests, goes back to the melody. For bingo, one rest, back to the melody. And then bluey, there's no rest. So with this method, it would sound something kind of like this. One, two, three. Mom! Right? Just waiting time. One, two. Yeah! Five, five. One. Bingo! <laughs> and finally. Bluey! Now this is a method of understanding time that's not useful for professional musicians, but it's definitely useful for kids. Way more useful than thinking about like changing time signatures. And that's not the only alternative way of thinking about it. You could also think about it as measures of 4-4 four, four with fermatas. A fermata being just an unmeasured amount of time where you stop before going on to the next phrase. The argument for this is that what's going on in the visual of the introduction is the characters are playing a game of freeze dance where the music is starting and stopping and people have to freeze in place. The intro theme music is imitating and conveying that idea through measured silence, but the basic groove is still like 4-4. Four, four. This 4-4 four, four groove is a very popular one. It's based off of what we would call the Bo Diddley beat, which is named after, of course, the great Bo Diddley. Many other tunes, George Michael's Faith, for example, as well as I Want Candy, also use a beat like this. And so conceptually, compositionally, it's just a 4-4 four, four groove, but a little bit of extra time at the end because the characters are playing a game of freeze dance and that's what would happen. They would stop the music and then restart it. So like three possible answers, measures of 4-4 four, four, and 5-4, this like backwards counting down thing, and then measures of 4-4 four, four with a fermata. Which one is right? Is there any way we can test for the correctness of these solutions? Well, no. There is no way of quantifying a time signature. That's not something that you can test for scientifically in an audio recording. You can do things like measure the pitch of a sound, like in frequency, it's hertz. You can do other things like measure the amount of time in between hand claps in like milliseconds. That's something called the inter-onset interval. And you can also do things like measure the relative loudness and amplitude of a sound. But you cannot measure for time signature. Time signatures are not real. We made them up. There's something that we invented to understand our relationship to pulse. Like, does this thing feel like it's on the beat or off the beat? But beyond that, it's just a convenience that we use when we're playing with other musicians or when we're interacting with a digital audio workstation. So because this is a human perception thing, different people from different backgrounds might react differently to the music. And so there isn't a 100% correct answer on what the true time signature is. This is practical ramifications. This is not 
purely philosophical. A lot of the music for Bluey was recorded during the pandemic where different musicians had to record in their home studios. We send off a lot of the music to be recorded in people's home studios and they send the recordings back and we compile them all together. When they get these files, it is imperative that they're all on the same page when it comes to the time signatures that they are setting up in their DAW. Otherwise, it's a complete headache later when you try and organize all the files after the fact. So musicians need to be all on the same page in one way, but dancers might use another metric scheme to understand the music because of how they need to move on certain words like mom, dad, bingo, etc. It's super illuminating to see the bloopers for this particular video. Oh man, I love watching dancers listen to and like figure out music because the way that they're thinking about it is always very different from how musicians are. And it, it's very cool. It's super, super interesting, their sense of pulse and, and reaction. Anyway, all of this doesn't matter though, because as we all know, all music is in 4-4 if you don't count it like a nerd. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah! One, two. See what I mean? All music. Four, four. Doesn't matter. You nerds are making it too difficult. It's just four, four, guys. Come on. I think technically what I just did was a 17 against four polyrhythm. <laughs> Much more simple than that three measures of four, four. Just do a 17 against four polyrhythm. Way easier. <laughs> was the major sixth illegal in the Renaissance? Okay, I love this question because it's hinting at something that is very, very cool to me. Um, no, it wasn't illegal, and no, it wasn't in the Renaissance, but the major sixth was considered a strong dissonance. This sound right here was considered literally, let me read you this. Thus, we have an example of that vile and loathsome discord, which is the sixth, and which is mostly to be avoided. Vile and loathsome discord, wow. Not sure about that. This was written by Anonymous Four, the name given by historians to a music theorist of the 13th century. And when you expect a medieval music theorist to be talking about something vile and loathsome, chances are you're probably thinking about the tritone, the so-called devil in music, although it was never banned. Made a whole video about that. So when you read it about the sixth, that's very strange. American music theorist James Tenney wrote a book called A History of Consonance and Dissonance, which cataloged Europeans' perception of tension and dissonance in intervals from the past thousand years or so. And it has changed quite significantly. In one of the appendices to the book, Tenney tracks how different music treatises from over the years have defined consonance and dissonance. So if we look here in the ninth and 10th century, in the Musica Incariatis, we have the root, the octave, the fifth and the fourth, which are considered consonances, but then all of the other intervals are just considered dissonances. And that is including the sixths, which to our modern ears don't sound particularly dissonant. So if we look at how the minor and major sixth have been classified in all these music theory textbooks throughout the years, it's not really until the late 14th century where both the minor and major sixth are considered consonances, which is wild because nothing about the sound really changed, maybe little differences of tuning here and there, but it was rather how people in Europe were reacting to the sound in context. You know, many people, myself included, have fallen into this trap of trying to define dissonance in mathematical terms as if there is some quantifiable aspect of the sound which is dissonant. And you know, there are acoustic reasons why certain sounds might sound more active, we'll say, than other sounds which sound a little bit more passive. Whether or not that means tension, something that is vile and loathsome is purely based upon the culture making that music. Remember, this, several centuries ago, in 13th century Europe, was something to be avoided at all costs. Music's for the listener, but the first listener is the player. Thoughts? Yeah, this is something that I saw the jazz trumpet player Wynton Marcellus say in a video recently. Do you think jazz music is more for the player or for the listener? Music is always for the listener, but the first listener is the player. Mm. This is a line that Wynton Marcellus has been saying for a while. This is a tweet from a decade ago. So he's clearly been thinking about this line for a while. And you know, I do agree with this because on a certain level, you have to be profoundly selfish to make music and art. You have to be so megalomaniacal to believe that other people will just resonate with your message. So if you create music that excites you, 
you'll probably create music that excites other people. You have to be honest with yourself, though, because are you excited with the music that you're making, or are you just in love with the fact that you made music at all? It's a hard question to answer. Adam's getting philosophical. All right. E flat minor major seven, but like you tremolo an A in octaves really high up. Gladly. That minor major seven chord, like this with the sharp 11, that A natural on top is a pretty intense sound, but for like the final chord of a spy thriller, you know, it's that sound, it's nice. I think it's important here, the orchestration that you told me, because if you put that A natural down in the mix with the rest of the notes of the E flat minor major seven, it's much more stabby. It doesn't have that wide open mysterious sound. And if you put all the notes super low in the register of the piano, it's a much darker sound, especially if you, you know, play it rhythmically. All of a sudden we're in like Stravinsky territory, like we're about to sacrifice somebody. To me, orchestration and voicing is so important in the emotional affect of a sound, of a chord, of a color. We spend so much time talking about the emotional affect of different chords, like major's happy, minor's sad, diminished is dissonant, right? But how you voice a sound on an instrument or how you orchestrate a sound amongst different colors in an orchestra or through different synthesizer timbres, like has much more of an impact, I think, than the quality of the chord. This sound, for example, bright and open and airy and ethereal, but it includes the same notes as this sound, which sounds like somebody just punched a piano because that's pretty much literally what I'm doing. That's the musical effect. You know, the point is, is not the notes that you play, it's how you play them and their context. This, we're told sounds bright and happy, but this, not so much, same notes, different registration. This, we're told, sounds mysterious and spooky. This, much more aggressive. It's the same notes, it's just down two octaves. Pretty cool. Friendly reminder to drink more coffee. Thanks. Caffeine. What string gauges do you use? Almost exclusively the DR fat beams. They used to be the Marcus Miller fat beams. 45 to 130. I like them nice and heavy. Just got into Temple for music comp. No question, just proud. Hey, congratulations. You know, going to music school is super exciting to translate your passion into your study. You're gonna be surrounded with people who are equally as passionate as you are, and that is just very exciting. It's very, you know, emotionally and professionally and creatively rewarding. So don't forget to make friends, because honestly, as a composition major, your friends are the ones who are gonna be playing your music, and it is your friends who ultimately will make your music school experience the most rewarding. How does a guitar player stay out of the way of the bass in a band? EQ, my friends, EQ. like. Don't forget to roll off some of the low end if you're playing with a bass guitar player in an ensemble, especially if you're playing in a loud venue because that low end adds up and that will piss off your bass player, like yours truly. You can play low notes, no problem. You can chug the low notes of a seven string guitar, but just remember to roll off some of that bass because that 100 to 200 hertz register is my territory. Stay away, seriously. EQ. Been asking for ages. Please, tips for walking the bass. I made a minute long video six years ago about how to walk a jazz bass line, and I think it still kind of holds up. So these are all the tips that I know on how you might walk a jazz bass line. What's a good song in 5-8? Ether by Sungazer. 
go check us out. What do you think of fake musicians' videos going viral? You know, I've had enough of this stuff, man. Like, these people think that they can keep getting away with playing music and it's fake, it's like sped up. How dare they? Truly despicable. Love you, Ben. Love you. Love you. How do you impress somebody at an audition? It's difficult, if not impossible, to genuinely impress people with something that you think will impress them, if that makes any sense. You know, when I was a student at Berkeley, I used to work the auditions for prospective students and help you know, sign students in and move them from, you know, rehearsal room where they got to warm up to where they would actually audition, you know, in front of the teachers who are conducting the audition. And, you know, I remember talking to prospective students then, and there were so many people who were so concerned with trying to impress the judges, impress the teachers that were, you know, going to decide whether or not they could get into Berkeley. And so after I remember the conversation, it was like, you know, I, I learned Donna Lee or, I learned how to shred giant steps or something. But these kids were not really jazz musicians. They might have had more interest in rock or pop or music production, things like that. And they would learn what they thought was the most impressive piece of music to play for these jazz professors at the Berklee College of Music. And, you know, I would hear people, uh, you know, practice in their rehearsal rooms. And it was so clear that their heart was, really wasn't in it. Like, this was something that they learned as a technical exercise without engaging in any kind of meaningful way with the music. And you know, realistically, if your heart isn't into it, it doesn't matter how well you think you're playing, it comes across to whoever is auditioning you that you're half-assing it. And it's honestly, I feel like, much more impressive to put on an honest, heartfelt performance rather than try and impress somebody because they've already heard everything before. They've already heard Donnelly at a million BPM. I've never conducted a college audition, but if I was in that position, I'd really want to hear what you do best and what you say on your instrument. Because honestly, I've, I've, heard, I've heard people shred giant steps ridiculously fast. You're probably not going to do that, and that's okay. Sponsor, please? Sure thing. Henson shaving. You know, as a newly facial haired man, I am thinking a lot about shaving and trimming and making sure that I look good and nice and pretty for the camera. For the longest time, I was using razors that have those five blades per disposable head, which work, but at the same time, you go through those cartridges so quickly and I was spending upwards of 100, $150 a year just, you know, keep myself looking trim. Ultimately not sustainable, both for my budget and for the environment. This thing, on the other hand, is not that. This is something that is called a safety razor. I'm waving it around quite a lot like a wand, but it's okay because it's safe, I think. The difference here between this safety razor, the difference between a safety razor and one of those razors that use all those disposable cartridges is the fact that instead of five blades, this guy only has one blade. And these things are super cheap to manufacture. There's no plastic in the cartridges, so they're better for the environment. And yeah, it's much better for your budget and everything else. The main disadvantage of safety razors, which use these kind of single blades, is that traditionally they're not very user friendly. It's difficult to get the blade placed exactly right on the razor so that you don't hurt yourself, nick yourself, and so that there isn't any irritation. But the big advantage of this thing, the Henson AL13, the Henson razor, is the fact that this thing is very precisely machined. These are built in an aerospace machining shop in Canada that started making razors during the pandemic. Because of their experience and their equipment, they've made parts that are on the International Space Station. They're able to machine parts and design parts with a very, very fine tolerance. They've got it so once you put together the full assembly with the blade and the razor, the blade extends past the shave plane by only 0 0.0013 inches. This thing is ridiculously user-friendly. It's just as user-friendly as any of the razors with the disposable cartridges. I have been using this thing for about two months now. I've never hurt myself. I've never experienced any irritation. It's just a good, clean, smooth shave. Now, the best part about this is I'm not trying to sell you a subscription. I'm just trying to sell you a thing. This is just a really well-made razor. If you decide you want to invest in a quality safety razor like this one, you can go to hensonshaving.com 
and select which razor you'd like out of a variety of different colors. And when you use the promotional code Adam Neely at checkout when you're buying your razor, you'll also get a hundred of these stainless steel double edge replacement blades for free which will last you for a very long time. This will last you for years. This will last you for years. You won't have to be dealing with that subscription to traditional cartridge blades. You'll just have a quality razor with quality blades. Peace.